Good morning, everybody. It is Sunday. I got up early, I cleaned the house, which meant turning on the iRobot. And I marveled at all the technology that we now have in the 21st century, you know, to make our lives simple. And then I started reading my papers and uh, looking at the local news and, and then into the science news and world news. And uh, a post came up explaining the unexplainable with non-local consciousness. Guys, that's right up my alley. And I want to discuss it with you guys because even before that was a concept or an idea that I could understand, you know, 15 or 20 years ago, we would never have talked about in any setting, including a school setting, the idea of consciousness as being a non-local thing, not generated or made within the human body, particularly your brain, right? This is what science says, that neurons fire and synapses are created and pathways and we have thoughts and remembrance and we have sections which things are stored in and we retrieve information from. And we know that there is some partial truth to that through the fact that we see people with brain injuries that can no longer remember things or function Alzheimer's disease. We also have the idea that we can go have a few drinks on a Saturday night and our judgment, our cognitive thinking becomes impaired. So, you know, it makes sense that 150, 200 years ago, science would have said, because of these external factors that we see, obviously consciousness is created within the brain. However, there are so many things that happen and occur around us that could possibly be explained via a greater external consciousness, something we can tap into that I want to talk about today. And I want to give you guys an example. We've talked about it before on the channel a little bit. I talked about something I ran into in school many years ago while working on my BSc. I took an evolutionary biology class. Okay, one of my all-time favorite classes. Um, back in those days, Gary didn't think much about creationism or God, right? Materialistic worldview, 100%. We are made up of atoms. This is, you know, the way the universe works. We learn things that are passed on through generations. That's evolution. You know, biology can make changes through um, survival of the fittest. You know, these theories that a small change within a population, um, a famine, a drought, something, you know, uh, two inches of water in the desert causes all the short lizards to drown. So therefore, in that area, only long-legged lizards survive. Therefore, all generations after that will have long-legged lizards. Things like that, right? Evolutionary processes. I loved it. I, You know, I was 100% behind that. That's how things worked. But let me tell you guys that there were questions that arose even back then in those days. And one of them was something that scientists talk about as instinct. What is instinct? Well, I can't answer that. To this day, I still can't answer that. Maybe the idea of external consciousness might have something to do with that because I'll give you guys an example of what when we're talking about instinct, just one of hundreds of natural examples. And I know I've told you guys, some of you that have seen the channel before, we talked about this. Did you know that each uh, beehive has two queen bees born to each hive? Okay. And so back in the day, my professor was explaining this to the class. This is an example of instinct. Two different locations within the hive. Each house is one queen bee. They are going to hatch within a very close time to each other. Okay, the first one that hatches makes its way through the colony to the other queen's chamber and devours that queen will become the rightful queen. So immediately, Gary's arm goes up. The question's coming out of my mouth even. Wow, that's amazing. How does that happen? What, you know, my mind is racing. I'm deep thinking. I'm already six questions into this. The main question that I'm asking is really made up of a dozen other smaller questions. And I'm thinking my professor's going to get this. He's going to explain it all. And his answer was very simple, very quick, very confident. Pheromones. You know, this queen over here uses her sense of smell and smells the trail, which leads to the other queen. She devours her and becomes the queen. And I'm like, no, that doesn't answer. How does the queen know that she even needs to do this? 
right? Let alone the fact that she is going to be the ruler. She is going to know all of the things that needs to happen to rule this colony. And it's not like she's been born under the tutelage of a former queen who's going to teach her these things. She's just going to know it all. Okay, so the very deep process of where my mind was going and the answer that they supplied to me of pheromones. And okay, that's the process that the one queen uses to devour the second, but it doesn't explain the mechanics behind the consciousness of that bee. There has to be some form of consciousness there to say, to understand, I am going to rule, I'm going to lead my colony to prosperity. And to do that, my very first process, my step is to eliminate competition. So why does the hive have two queens born? Well, again, that's a process of evolution. In the olden days, you know, 10,000 generations ago when hives only had one queen born, if something happened to that queen's egg and she didn't hatch, then the hive was queenless. So to compensate, the hive itself, moving forward, created two queens. So again, we have to ask, you know, these steps of evolution, they are all tapered by things that have happened in the past. And my thought process on that is why do we not forget the reason that things are? Why would a, a, a beehive 10,000 generations down the line say, you know, it's a lot of extra work and a lot of extra nutrition to create two queens. What do we need two queens for? One's just going to go eat the other one. Let's, uh, let's go back to making a hive with just one queen, right? Again, why, why doesn't that happen? <laughs> Again, it's a process of evolution, and they say that that wouldn't happen because those hives would become ex those hives did become extinct. My question is, why can they not go back? And why can they not become a force of selection and become a new choice? Maybe something that didn't work before. It was just a random luck of the draw. It all points to creationism, I guess, is where I'm going with this, guys. Eventually, if you think about these things long enough and deep enough, it's like a human playing the game Sim Earth back in the day. If you remember the computer game, there was a game where you actually created and maintained and controlled all of the processes on the planet. And that was a great way to learn you know, weather systems, climate systems, and then as, as the planet grew civilizations and how things interacted and worked. I don't know. Is there some god up there playing Sim Earth with our reality? I don't know. But where I'm going with that is that those two bees would have to have some kind of external knowledge, instinct in this case, telling them that you must do this in order to survive. You know, and where, where I'm taking that with what we do on this channel, guys, we do a lot of paranormal stuff, investigation. And the materialistic view of the brain and consciousness would state that a human should never be able to tell the future, speak to someone who's not close or see or know events or facts that aren't in this time period, let alone in this localized area. And yet it happens all the time. We have psychics. We have people who have dreams that come true. Things that they know they shouldn't know. Events that are going to happen that do come true and happen. I myself have experienced many things where I say I know something before it's happened. And it was more so when I was a kid. But again, if my brain, if these processes in my brain are creating my reality, how do I know something that is yet to happen in the future? It just shouldn't be. If I had a, an external force that I could tap into, something that's connected to me all of the time, I guess this is the, the concept a greater connectedness. And if you look at people who say they've had near-death experiences, this is what they say. We're all connected. We are all really one coming from a higher source. And there is a connection. And you can tap into that. Some people more so than others. Now, I'm very lightly attuned to that, guys. I don't have visions. I don't. Uh, I can't tell you winning lottery tickets or anything like that. But sometimes I get a feeling and I know something's going to happen or don't do this or do that. Etc. And you just follow that. Something else worth mentioning, if we're going to discuss this, I guess, is, you know, if we're going to point to materialism as being proven through um, trauma or damage to a brain or alcohol or things like that that can affect the brain, what about the reverse of that, where people have had 
brain trauma or injuries or accidents and they come back with um, an ability that they never had before to speak another language, mathematical skills, uh, playing an instrument, art, all of these things. Many of these things have been documented. It's actually called spontaneous savant syndrome where these people just become masters of a craft, something they had never learned or spent any time working on, and a sudden blow to the head or something like that, and they come back and they're completely changed. Now, many of these people back in the day, it was never talked about, had near-death experiences, okay? And many of those people who come back from near-death experiences talk about other powers and abilities that they have, which are not... Uh, everyday things like the ability to play music or speak another language, they talk about being able to see people's auras or to know the future or to speak to the dead, things that are really on another level. And they can be tested and there are people out there who have proven, been proven to have these abilities, as crazy as it sounds. And all of these things kind of, to me, can explain some of the things I've always questioned and wondered about if the universe is made of something other than materialism, whether, what about light? You know, they want to call it consciousness. A lot of these papers say, what if the universe is made of consciousness? Well, what is that? What if it's just light? I, I like to think, what if it's light? What if the universe is really just made of light? And everything comes from light, which I guess is, con I mean, you can call it consciousness. You can call it whatever you want. But I know light plays a part in this. And everyone who has these experiences near death or have crossed over or been born with uh, precognitive memories of be from before they were born, um, they all talk about the same things, light. And the older I get, having gone through an opening experience myself at the age of 36, and that's the other thing too, guys. I keep saying, oh, I've, I went through this experience, you know, in Dark Night of the Soul, an opening of the mind from about 36, and then again it happened at 46, like a, it never stopped, it was a process over that 10 years, and then again, and both of these were kind of a deep, dark depression at the beginning and at the end of that 10 year period that started it, and that, I wouldn't say finished it, but I feel like I am awake, I am, I, there are, I'm sure I can be more awake than I even know right now, I, I don't know, because you won't know the process until you're done, right? until we die, until we move on. But can you continually, you know, experience these things? And do you experience them more once they start? Absolutely. And there is more to this place than materialism. And I have changed from my 20s to my 30s to my 40s, closing in on 50, guys, and uh, I'm, I'm probably going to change again. But there is something to it. There are things that cannot be explained through basic scientific processes that are still being taught in universities to this day. A lot of your sciences, guys, if you've taken science, you know, if you take a physics course, for example, these are the same things that were taught, the basic level, you know, science courses, are the same things that were taught 200 years ago. The basic principles, Bohr's Law, you know, you hear of gravity and Newton and all, all of the basic things that have been around for hundreds of years are still taught to this day. Now, only when you get into further, higher courses and learning do you start, you know, maybe touching on the new stuff. And then you get people going off and doing their own new research in these fields. But anyone can end up with a BSc and have just the basic understanding of the sciences and how they work. And most people are not going to school past high school taking BSCs, right? There are great numbers, but there are tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of people doing other things, taking other things. So they're left with these same impressions that they were taught in elementary, grade, and high school. And once those ideas are ingrained in your head, it's hard to turn that off and think. Many people have never even had the thought, what if my brain is not creating my consciousness? What if my consciousness is coming from somewhere else and the brain is really just a receptor. We have to think of the brain as an, an antenna maybe, right? That's how I'm beginning to think about this is my consciousness is being projected possibly to this form and I'm stuck here I'm, somehow. Uh, we've talked about it. You know, I, I think that this is just 
uh, a place we go to learn, experience, have adventures, get engaged in the things that we are interested in. That's what I think this Earth experience is. We've talked about it. And so this whole projection of consciousness to my body doesn't change that at all but it does answer some of the other questions like instinct and how i know things i shouldn't know and what do you guys think about the possibility of a non-local consciousness there are so many papers on this maybe i'll link to a couple papers um, i would actually like to find a really good book to read on this uh, just something new that i've been thinking about over the last couple months here uh reading Dr. Scott Peck again, and he talks about the grace of God and all of these things. Again, all of that stuff can be tied into non-local consciousness. Spirits and paranormal could be examples of this non-local consciousness. What we're contacting, you know, when the voices come through the spirit box and say, this is uh, Elta, I was your aunt, you know, and they're lining things up saying a name which we found on the back of a photograph just one example of many of the things guys how does the spirit box know that we have to get past that and say the spirit box has nothing to do with it it's something else is it a case of non-local consciousness like you know just because the body is no longer here doesn't mean that the consciousness isn't still here that could explain all the spirit stuff the paranormal stuff the the contact it's my belief that this stuff needs investigating. Grant as well. Now, I don't think he's ever looked at it from a non-local conscious uh, perspective. We've never talked about it, so I don't know. But I don't think so. I think he looks at it strictly in a spiritual context of when we leave this form, we no longer need a body, but we could still be spirits and be around in spirit form. And that may be the case. But what if it is... Consciousness as a collectiveness, you know, the whole universe could be. It will never answer, I'll never be able to answer this, but I do feel I can do experiments and investigate this. And that's what we do. That's on this channel, that's what we do. And so, I, in the last video, you know, I did a, some spirit boxing in the bedroom because we had, again, something contacted me, brushed my hair, touched me 100%. I am sure that happened. Then my wife saw pillow move on its own so again right there it tells you she doesn't believe in any of this stuff she immediately put it down to a source of something physical that would happen in our reality which is mice but we don't have mice in this house 100 percent, i am sure of that but to her that's what made sense something moved it there is not a possibility in her reality that there is spirits or non-local consciousness or anything like that so that thought doesn't even cross her mind that that's why the pillow would move, right? I get warnings from you guys, uh, you're bringing religion into it, and religion has nothing to do with it, right? And I say that in a way of, let me just summarize it this way, guys. You are either a being of light and goodness, or you're not. You either work in the light and spread the light and love, or you don't. There, it doesn't have to be tied to a religion, right? And we do not have to fear the unknown just because we don't know what's moving that pillow or coming through the spirit box or leaving EVPs doesn't mean we have to fear it. doesn't mean that it's a devil or a demon or a, something nasty. It could be, but absolutely, I believe in my own ability and power to use the light to protect myself, my spirit guides, my spirit group. I believe we all have that, people that guide us from the other side. Again, collective consciousness uh, could there be thousands of people on our spirit teams? I don't know. That's a possibility, but it's there and it exists and I believe in it and I do not fear the unknown. And I don't think you guys should either, but we don't have to bring religion into it in any form because it's all about goodness and lightness and love. And that's all it is. And if you have that and you carry that and you promote and project that, you have nothing to worry about.